So good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of a strange, strange day for us all here in the Bay Area, but hello and, and welcome. I'm Carla Thorson. I'm Senior Vice President for Programs here at World Affairs. Um, and today marks the first day of our Elections 2020 program series. So until Election Day, we'll be holding a series of virtual conversations on key issues affecting our democracy, like housing, healthcare, disinformation, and the role of the media, along with some key global policy challenges like climate change, uh, the changing role of the US in the world, and our relations with key countries and regions around the world. So we're glad to see you all virtually here today. Um, and we're eager to learn more about some of the pressing issues, both at home and abroad. And we hope that you'll think about these before casting your vote this November. Um, Today, we're gonna to be discussing one of the most pressing issues both here in the US, but particularly here in the Bay Area, and that's the housing crisis. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today. We have Connor Doherty of the New York Times and California State Senator Scott Weiner. Connor Doherty is an economics reporter at the New York Times, and he previously spent a decade in New York covering housing and the economy for the Wall Street Journal. He grew up here in the Bay Area and, and lives here with his family in Oakland. And we're joined, we're delighted to be joined uh, as well by Senator Scott Weiner, who represents San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County in the California State Senate. Elected in 2016, Senator Weiner focuses extensively on housing, transportation, civil rights, criminal justice reform, clean energy, and alleviating poverty. He chairs the Senate Housing Committee and also chairs the California Legislative LGBTQ Caucus. And so really, I'm delighted that the two of you are joining us today. And for everyone that's interested in more about this topic, please do check out Connor's new book called Golden Gates, Fighting for Housing in America. So welcome to you both. And I'm gonna step out of the way because I'm not an expert on this, this topic, but both of you are. Um, and I'm going to let Connor kick off the conversation. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Senator Weiner and I uh, have met many times over the years. And he's actually in the book. So this is a little awkward, <laughs> but um, that's OK. Um, I guess I think, um, by the way, they, they said that you focus on these things and then like listed like 25 things. I don't think you've ever focused on anything. Uh, you've been the most prolific bill writer in most of the places you've ever been, I think. Um, but anyway, so it's kind of funny because we're gonna focus on housing today, but every time I talk to you, there's like 55 other things going on that we never even get to. But anyway, so maybe that'll yeah. be a future webinar. But um, yes. well, like for instance, this year you had this, your, your biggest bill this year was this uh, LGBT. Uh, uh, yeah, I um, yes, I, uh, I definitely does clear up some of that because this is you've been quite in the news lately with QAnon. So yes, I, I've gone from the NIMBYs to QAnon, and um, I decided I'll take the NIMBYs over QAnon. Um, uh, and uh, and now we have. I'll show you. This is noon in San Francisco. If you can look outside of. Yeah, it's basically like an eclipse outside. Um, yeah, so I'm, I have a criminal justice reform bill to stop discriminating against LGBTQ young people on the sex offender registry. Uh, not the most popular issue to deal with, but it's real. And so QAnon is, uh, uh, the tidal wave of QAnon is including Ted Cruz and Rush Limbaugh and Donald Trump Jr. are coming after me. Uh, so it's a, definitely a different situation than the housing fights that we've had. Yes. Well, um... I, I guess you're somewhat used to this because the first time I ever s met you, you were you, there was a Fox News clip when you were at the San Francisco Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. that had come after you. Anyway, so keeping with I think I went after them, and then they oh, came yes, back exactly. up. Well, they, so it was it was mutual to talk to them, <laughs> if I recall. Um, yeah. So I guess kind of keeping on the election theme for a moment uh, for this series. One question I wanted to ask, <coughs> open-ended question. Um, what is the most consequential election you think right now for housing? And I'm asking you this question, assuming 
that many of our of the people watching either aren't in California or at least aren't in San Francisco. So if you're concerned about housing, what is the most consequential election for you if right now or in November? Well, I'm going to have to give a nuanced answer, Connor. I'm okay, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, I don't know if Brooklyn now, but he used to, he grew up right down the street from where I live. So yes. we're, we were former neighbors and then we gentrified him out of the city. So I'm sorry, Connor. Um, no problem. I, I believe so, I was in the district, but anyway. You were right in the district. My dad um, is. Exactly. Um, so it's tempting to say president. Um, because we've now, and this is a good thing that, you know, what used to be considered a purely local issue housing then became a state issue and now has become increasingly federalized, which is good because it used to be a federal issue back when we made massive federal investments in subsidized public housing, and then we stopped. Uh, and we've seen um, in Democratic primary, and this was just music to my ears, the fact that you had, they were all putting out housing platforms and you had Elizabeth Warren, Warren and Bernie Sanders and, uh, Cory Booker and uh, and Castro and uh, you know everyone putting out platforms on zoning reform, this like nerdy thing called zoning reform and streamlining, and it it, be, it was a um, uh, it, it was it was great that they were debating it. Uh, and the federal government does have a role to play, particularly in providing more funding <clears throat> for affordable housing. Um, but the the most important elections for the future of housing are your city council members and your mayors uh, and really making sure that people know who they're voting for and understand if their local elected officials actually support people having access to housing. Uh, and um, so that's the most important. I think a close second are your state legislative elections because we've seen more and more in California, for example, more and more pro-housing state legislators uh, but we need even more. Uh, so I would say it goes in reverse order. The, the city council and mayor races are the most important. How do you think the national election will affect any of this? Um, we've seen a lot of, uh, of conversation about it. There's a lot of, as you said, tone stuff. You know, there's uh, Trump has gotten rid of this affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, HUD rule, which is like this wonky thing. It can be important, but it doesn't have to be important. You know, you know, so how do you think the national election, well, I guess just yeah. broadly about this, you know, because I don't think we're going to get some giant housing bill that will change everything, but the tone, I don't know, how do you, what role do you see it playing? Well, <clears throat> I think it, it could have positive and negative. Uh, what I've found in housing policy, at least at the state level, um, the dynamics, it's been very not partisan, right? There are, there are times when, you know, super left-wing Democrats and super right-wing Republicans are aligned in favor of uh, making it easier to build more housing and super left-wing Democrats and right-wing Republicans are aligned against it. And it was more a factor of what kind of district do they represent? Um, if you're a, if, if you represent a coastal wealthy uh, community, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're going to have some challenges around NIMBYism. And so in, in the housing, in the hard housing work that I've done, I've been able to get a, a fair amount of Republican support and liberal Democratic support. It's been very, very not based on parties. My concern is that we're going to start seeing more partisanship around housing um, because, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we had presidential candidates um, taking on these, you know, or adopting strong pro-housing platforms, which is great when I have some progressive critics um, who criticize my work around zoning, and I just say I'm aligned with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and, and, and others. But the fact that Donald Trump uh, decided to become the NIMBY in chief this year, which is different, presidential administrations have, all, have including Obama and then Trump, had put out fairly pro-housing um, documents about needing to have zoning reform, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, that, and, and what Trump and Ben Carson put out was very similar to what Obama um, had, had put out. Um, just a year ago. So what you're referring to is just a year ago. A year ago. Trump put out and Ben Carson, 
Yeah. Ben Carson came to San Francisco and toured public housing and said, you have to reform the zoning. You have to, you know, so it was, it, there, it was not, again, it was not a particularly partisan issue. But now that Trump is, you know, God willing, in his death spiral uh, as president, not physically, I would never wish death on anyone, but his political death spiral, he is so desperate and he's losing the suburbs. And so he has gone on these rants on Twitter and elsewhere about, you know, Joe Biden wants to end the suburbs by forcing black people and or forcing you to allow black people and poor people to live in your community by building multi-unit housing and ending single family home zoning and super racist. Everything that every every word that comes out of his mouth about this and many other things, but it is um, uh, unfortunately potentially shifting the part, making it a more of a partisan issue that Republicans will have less space to support things like ending single family home zoning because Trump has riled his base, uh, and, and it just makes life harder for Republicans who who get it. So my concern is that the national dynamic could be making housing more of a partisan issue, which it isn't, it should, and it should never be a partisan issue. Yeah, I, and it's interesting to hear you say that um, because I've always relished uh, housing being, a, a, as you say, a, well, I guess I would say it's a very partisan issue, but it's not a partisan issue in the way we define red and blue currently, right? You know, obviously there's, when, when you say NIMBY versus YIMBY, that's partisan, but it's a different kind of partisanship. Right. Well, yeah, it's, and you have, you have, you know, there are some Democrats who, there are Democrats who, in California, who make the same exact arguments, maybe in a more polished way than what Donald, as what Donald Trump is saying. Um, there are some very partisan issues in housing when you move away from production. So funding, um, you have, you know, Republicans are much less likely to support government involvement in subsidizing housing affordability um, uh, and also renter protections, um, trying to you know, stabilize renters and have some level of rent control or eviction protections, that becomes a very partisan issue. Mm -hmm. So um, have you, it's fun, but it's, it's interesting to hear you say this because I hadn't really thought about, um, I'd obviously noticed that Trump I covered in Carson when he came out here. So I was sitting there with my notebook at the public housing complex. And it was, it was a strange, honestly, as a reporter, it was a strange thing for me because he's sitting there saying, he literally said, I mean, I have it like in a recorder. I went and looked it up the other day in a transcript. He literally said, we should make it uh, uh, illegal to refuse public housing or uh, uh, section eight vouchers, which I was like, oh, wow. You know, he was complaining about NIMBYs, as you say. And he was touring this public housing complex saying, look how nice this is. People think this will look horrible in their neighborhood, but I'm here to say how wonderful, you know. And I remember at the time, I think I may have even called you for comment and been like, um, mm -hmm. I think it was difficult in a partisan way the other way, where Democrats didn't really, where they were leery of agreeing. I mean, of course, at the same time, you had the president literally that same day saying like, we need to get rid of homeless people because it's offending condo owners. Right. So it was, it was a mixed message. But I guess my question is, have you seen any indication yet that uh, housing and this issue of, of development is becoming more partisan? Because I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks, but is there anything in your little kind of political radar where you see things gurgle no. up that tells you that this is happening? Um, so when you look at, uh, so we had a, I'm sure you'll get to this, a very not good housing year in the California legislature for many different reasons. Um, but Republicans were still voting for these bills this year. Um, mm -hmm. And so we were, so the Republicans that had been pro-housing before were still voting that way. So it, it does not seem to have trickled um, down from the White House to, you know, um, to, to at least to our capital, I'm I'm praying that that will not change because you know again I'm a super lefty Democrat from San Francisco, but on how on there are a, a number of issues in our that we deal with that are not partisan, and there's more working across the aisle in the California legislature than I think we see in Congress. Uh, but housing is one of those issues where we have a, a good loose alliance between some Democrats and some Republicans where we are able to, you know, help move through some of these hard housing 
um, policies. And so I really hope it doesn't change. I, I, when things, you know, there's some issues that are inherently super partisan, and that is what it is, but I hate it when issues that are really just about the basics of life somehow become partisan. We've seen what has happened with COVID becoming partisan. It's just, it's, it's just astounding and it's so depressing that basic science would become uh, uh, partisan. I don't want that to happen with other issues that have no business being partisan. Yeah, it's, um, but I, I think it, we're going to get to the housing stuff in a second, but I, I think it's fun that just to keep with the election theme. Uh, I think, though, that what's interesting to me about the partisanship stuff is that people aren't as ideological as they think they are, you know, so for instance, I mean, I say this in all my book talks, you can go to a very red suburb of Dallas or something, and you will find people who's, um, who will tell you that they don't want the government to interfere with their life and property rights are sacrosanct, and then will fight uh, to have a multifamily, fight against having a multifamily housing, allowing someone else to have an apartment building on there, you know, and will say we right. need to erect all these laws. So they're in conflict with other things. By the same token, you will see all sorts of, and this is like your life, um, people who claim to be very lefty and concerned about uh, people who are less well off from them and wanting to get rid of um, the structures of systemic racism in San Francisco, but then will fight uh, an affordable housing development or higher property taxes or whatever next to them. Right. And so on the one hand, you could call it, I mean, this is often called out as hypocrisy, right? But I think it's something deeper than that. It's that there's something that, that those two people are sharing. Does that make sense? It just doesn't fit into partisanship. It fits into right. how they feel about their neighborhood, what they really want around them. Right. And um, I guess what I'm saying is, do you think there's something more fundamental there? Because it's too easy to just call well, there it. Is, yeah, it, well, it's also, you look at taxes. It's, we, you know, we have beyond supermajority of Democrats in California legislature, and, and we don't, it's almost impossible for us to pass taxes. Um, which require two thirds vote, so it's inherently hard. Um, but we even very progressive tax measures just immediately die. They often don't even get a hearing in a committee. Um, and I, when I, I repeatedly um, proposed California having an estate tax because the federal government has destroyed the federal estate tax. Um, and every time I do that, um, it's super painful <laughs> because I get lots of very liberal lefty Democrats who freak out about it um, because they don't want to pay the same way a Republican doesn't want to pay. So in a lot of these issues, it's just about human beings and human psychology and the fact that we all have a little angel and a little devil on our shoulders and you have, you know, as human beings, who are like, do I want to be self-focused or community-focused? And, and all human beings struggle with that, although there's some who are on extreme uh, ends. Uh, and I think that is true of some of these housing tax, other similar kinds of issues where Democrats and Republicans can often align in pushing back and saying, I don't want to pay more taxes. I don't want more people people living in my neighborhood. I'm concerned about you know, low income housing causing crime. Um, and there's those commonalities. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think local is where people realize it will affect them. You know, like if you talk about higher tax in the abstract, people assume it'll be some billionaire that they'll don't have to deal with that will be paying a higher tax. Whereas when you talk about building a multifamily near them, they feel like they're giving something tangible. Uh, so, anyway, well, you've um, made kind of a national reputation for yourself. I, I had someone from New York the other day call us and call me and say, oh, we're going to do, I probably shouldn't even say this, but uh, they said, we're going to do something like SB 50, or we're going to try to propose something like SB 50, which is, of course, this bill that you introduced uh, in the legislature two years in a row, and that was after another one. But without getting caught down in this, uh, bogged down in this uh, sort of bill numbers and all these different things, can you just quickly tell me, or, you know, your framework if you could snap your fingers or what would be in your cerebral guy, what would be your framework for good housing legislation? What should it look like? Um, how should it work? And, and then if you could also, as part of that, 
talk about the balance between cities and a state. So you, you are a state legislature and you can tell us your framework for good legislation on housing, but also who makes what decisions and what it really looks like. Um, and speak about yeah. it in course, the broadest way yeah. so that people yeah. can- Yeah, there, there are a few basic things that have to happen and we have to back out from how many homes do we need? We know in California, we were you know, somewhere between two and a half and three and a half million homes short. And that shortage really started to accrue when we clamped down 50 years ago and made it harder and harder to build housing. But the things that have to happen is, first of all, we need to zone for enough housing. That's the basic math. Zoning is how much housing is legal to build where. Um, and we need to, so we need to increase the zoning to encompass enough housing over time and we need to make sure that that zone capacity is in the right places near jobs near transit not creating sprawl not not you know minimizing the severe wildfire zone uh, construction and so sort of focusing it in urbanized areas um, that are you know proximate to uh, uh, jobs proximate to transit so the zoning piece and sustainable zoning not sprawl zoning um, is what is piece one. That's the foundation. Then above it, we have to make sure that projects are actually getting approved in a timely manner, and we move away from having a random, arbitrary, discretionary, capricious system, where even if you come forward and say, "Here are the rules that you set: this height, this density, these design standards, this setback, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Here, I have a project with all your rules. You might still have to go through a three, four, five, ten-year process. It might get approved at only half um, of what was zoned for. It might cost you so much that you go bankrupt. Um, so that we're so we have the zoning that says how much, and that people have certainty and they know that if they comply with all the requirements, it simply gets approved. We call approved. We call that ministerial or by right approval. Um, I like to also refer to it as don't change the rules in the middle of the game. You set the rules out and someone complies with it, it's done. Uh, and so we did a streamlining law that I authored in SP35 in 2017, and a major affordable housing developer told us recently that SP35 had cut their approval time on average from seven years to four months. And that's what bridge we're- Bridge housing, so, if I recall. That was bridge, yeah. So the, um, so the zone capacity and then certainty and speed in, in approving the projects, um, and then funding for subsidized low-income housing, whether it is for building it or for rent subsidies. We don't do nearly enough to stabilize low-income residents to get them housing and stabilize them financially in that housing uh, because we have to acknowledge this has always been a problem for, for our lowest-income residents and it's gotten worse and worse. The market isn't going to solve it um, anytime soon because we are so imbalanced with the massively increased what we invest in subsidized housing, whether it's vouchers or construction or conversion, like we're gonna convert a bunch of motels into permanent housing, et cetera. And then the fourth piece is stabilization of people in the housing that they have, and that's renter protections, um, which is always very contentious. And um, you know, I'm a, we have rent control in San Francisco and I'm a supporter of rent control and just cause eviction uh, protections. Um, we, we need that stability, um, but we, uh, there are too many, there's millions and millions of renters in California and across the country, and COVID's making it worse, who are being destabilized and pushed out of their housing, and that's how you spike homelessness. So most of our homeless population are, do not have mental health or addiction issues. They just can't afford housing, and they're often people who were housed or marginally housed, they got pushed out, and they're now living in cars, or they're couch surfing, or they're living in, uh, in shelters, and they become destabilized and that's unhealthy. So those are the four things, zoning, streamlining, uh, and certainty, uh, funding, and renter protections. So, um, okay, so that's, that's your framework. And uh, over the past, say, I guess, I guess as soon as you've been elected, because your first bill was a housing bill on your first day in office, um, you've, you've worked on various things. Um, to, to summarize, uh, you, did this streamlining law that passed um, that uh, you, in the speech at the signing ceremony, you basically said, I'm not done, I'll be back next year. Uh, and subsequently, you've introduced basically the same bill, I mean, we could quit a lot of this, but three times, uh, a zoning bill. It, the first version was 
called SB827, the second was called SB50, and then it, I guess it's twice, but it was in the session three times. Right. And um, the basic gist of this bill was that you would make it possible to build four story apartment buildings uh, within a mile of public transit. And there were debates over buses versus trains and whatever, but generally speaking, that was the bill. Okay, so, and it felt like that bill came relatively close to passing. Uh, the governor never supported it, but he kind of intimated that he kind of liked it or was spiritually in sync with it or whatever. Um, uh, it lost by one vote or two votes, or but it was very, you know, it was like, felt like down to the wire. So fast forward to this year, there was a duplex bill, which I believe you were a co-sponsor of, but it was uh, the Senate president's bill, um, which I don't know exactly how the Senate works, but you would think uh, they would have an easier time getting bills through. Anyway, and this was just a bill that was considerably less ambitious than yours. And it felt like it got dispatched even more easily. So I guess my question is, I kind of have two questions. My first is, what have you learned through this, you know, this battle that has defined your entire time as a senator? Like what lessons have you learned about why this is hard and what can be accomplished? And then my second question is, as part of this is like, are we going backwards? Because it felt like there was a moment when we were discussing hugely ambitious things. And now we're discussing things that are much less ambitious and they seem to be having a harder time. Yeah, and there was another bill um, that you didn't mention, Senate Bill 828 that completely changed uh, how housing goals are set in California. And so we dramatically increase the housing goals that cities are receiving in California, which is important because that can lead to more streamlining, et cetera. Uh, but yes, we spent about um, you know three years working on zoning uh, reform. Um, and uh, the thing with SB 50 is that is a bill that five, six, seven, ten years ago uh, would have been laughed out of the building the minute it was introduced this sort of radical notion of the state overriding local zoning in a significant way. Um, and uh, it would not have even gotten a hearing probably. So when we introduced it in 2018, it did get a hearing and we actually had the votes in committee to get it out. And then votes, some votes flipped at the end and we failed in committee. Then we came right back in 2019 and then the bill had legs. And, and, and the, the interesting thing when we first introduced it in its original form that year, it just, and I didn't, I knew, I just thought this is a hard bill. We might pass it, we might not pass it. It's gonna be a big fight. It like touched the public imagination, both favorably and unfavorably. It got like that bill, the amount of discussion, it's just seeped into the public consciousness in a way that I never anticipated where people were like, oh yeah, I was, I came back, I was at my you know Thanksgiving dinner in San Bernardino County and my parents raised it. Um, it was, it was, it, very positive, I think, even whether people hated it or loved it, that it really elevated the discussion to force people to talk about housing and to force people to talk about, hey, when we say housing is too expensive, when I say my kid's not going to be able to afford to live here, when I say I'm worried about homelessness, when I say that I want to move into a place for my growing family, but I can't afford it, when I say these things, am I just complaining and being mad and, you know, talking smack on social media? or do we actually want to do something about it? And here's something that's not a silver bullet or the global solution, but a meaningful step towards addressing a big piece of the problem. What did it? So are we going to do that or not? Um, and so it forced many, many, many conversations. And I think did really, even though the bill itself never passed, helped open the door for a lot of other housing bills and really, really moved the, the, the ball forward significantly. Um, and, um, and so that was, I think, um, significant. Uh, and then the next year when we came back, it flew, it flew out of the Senate Housing Committee. Um, it flew out of the Senate Governance and Finance Committee. I don't want to suggest there wasn't a lot of hard work and negotiations and changes we had to make to the bill. But we moved it through these two committees with overwhelming votes. And then it became a two-year bill because there was someone who was a, a gatekeeper to the floor, a senator who, who, who delayed it. Um, and then we, you know, this January, when it came forward, and its deadline to get out of the Senate was the end of January, <clears throat> we had um, 20 votes. We ended up with 8, 8, 21, we, 
18 were on the scoreboard, um, but we had votes that were prepared, senators that would have voted yes had we had that 21st vote. And we had, we had those votes and then some people flipped at the end. We had a huge problem in Los Angeles um, where only one, LA is 25% of the states, so 25% of our legislature is LA County. Um, and of the 10 senators in LA County, only one voted for it. So you can, we still almost passed it, but that really hobbles you. Um, and so uh, the bill died. <clears throat> Um, our Senate president, Senator Tony Atkins from San Diego, who's a real champion for housing and has been back to her days on the San Diego City Council, announced this isn't over. We're going to do um, some big housing stuff this year. She convened a working group of senators who were not the partisans, but the people in the middle who might have voted yes or no to try to gauge them what, you know, what could pass. And from that group, we, we came up with a suite of housing bills, including the duplex bill that, that, that Senator Atkins authored and I joint authored with her, which was actually more of a fourplex bill because it allowed you by right to build a duplex anywhere. Um, you also had the right to split your lot if it was big enough and to build two duplexes, so really fourplex if it was a big enough lot. Um, so it was a very good bill. Um, and then we had some other bills. I had a bill to um, allow churches and other nonprofits to build affordable housing on their land, even if the cities didn't allow it. Um, we had a bill to uh, make it much easier and faster for cities to upzone more densely if they want to. Uh, and there was a bill to uh, allow um, underutilized commercial real estate to be converted into housing or mixed use, um, and some other good bills in both houses as well. And then we had like a I don't know if you want to call it, I wouldn't say a comedy of errors because nothing about 2020 has been comedic. I would say a calamity of, of errors and problems. Um, we started having significant tension with labor. Uh, the building trades decided to take a more um, assertive and aggressive approach to, to saying, okay, if you're going to pass these streamlining laws, we want to have stronger labor protections. And so that ended up um, causing some bills not to be able to pass. Uh, we had strong NIMBY opposition to some bills, which killed some of them. Uh, and then in the end, a few bills did pass, but the big one was this duplex or fourplex bill by our Senate leader, which had passed the Senate easily. Um, uh, and yes, having the Senate your president as the author definitely makes it uh, easier, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and then it was on the assembly floor and, and there we had significant uh, drama yeah. between the two houses at the end, and the bill ended up passing the assembly five minutes before our uh, legislative session question, expired, you know, and so it died. For, for everyone listening who doesn't know all about all these bills and everything, I guess my question is like, what have you learned about why this is so hard? You know, uh, it's, it's something that could apply to any state, you, you know, because I mean, I do these Q and A's for my book, and it's the same questions everywhere. You know, everyone has their own version of SB 50, their own details, right? But there's, what have you learned about why this is so hard? And can, how will that, can you give us a little preview of next year? How will that change what you try to do in the future? Assuming well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's okay. hard because it's about control. Um, and my, my view is, you know, the whole local control, state control debate, it, it, it is, it's the most, it's one of the most specious, um, disingenuous debates I have ever heard. It's a little bit like the federal versus state right, states' rights. Um, well, when you look at who's advocating for federal decision-making versus state decision-making, it's whoever controls Congress doesn't want state decision-making. Whoever's out of power wants state decision-making. It's a completely disingenuous. There are a small number of people who have philosoph strong, strongly held views about whether federal or state is better, but for the most part, it's just pure politics. It's a results-driven um, uh, debate. Same with state versus local control. Um, I, I literally, the, the Los Angeles City Council uh, almost simultaneously opposed two bills that I was authoring. One, SB 50, that took away some local control. And another bill I had that gave more local control by saying cities, only if they want to, can have later nightlife. Pure local control bill. They opposed both because it wasn't about local control. It was about, it, it was about we don't want to be forced to have more housing and, and we don't want to have, even have the option of having uh, later nightlife. 
Um, and so it was the politics around those issues, not about whether it's local or state. I happen to think that local control is often a good thing, but around housing, it's been a disaster to have this pure local control we've had. It's it is what has given us a multi-million home deficit because it's a race to the bottom. Uh, people can say, well, other, other communities can absorb the housing. My community is just not the right one for a litany uh, of reasons. Or cities that say, well, we're considering doing housing, but our neighbors aren't doing any, so why should I do it? And so it becomes a race to the bottom, which we would never tolerate around public education, so we need state standards. Um, but people want to have control over what happens in their neighborhoods, and it freaks them out that they may, there could be some project that's coming in, they don't know what it is, that's going to come in and they're going to be forced to accept it and they're not going to be able to have complete control. And the other dynamic here is that, and this is true in politics in a number, of, it's true with gun, like, like with guns, where we know that, you know, large majority of people want more gun safety standards, but the, but the activism is it's so stilted with the, with the gun rights people that it distorts the process. Well, it's true in housing too. When you do polling, overwhelmingly, including homeowners, People want more housing. They're willing to accept multi-unit in their neighborhood. They're willing to accept affordable housing in their neighborhood. Um, that's everywhere across all demographics. Um, but the people who are participating at the city council level in particular, and also the state legislative level, it's very self-selecting. It's people who are really angry that there might be more development in their neighborhood. And so when I would have you know, colleagues say to me around SB 50, not a single person in my district supports your bill. And I would look at them and say, you know what, with all respect, um, you're wrong. You're just hearing from a self-selecting group of people. And there are plenty of people in your community, and the polling shows it, who support this, but they're not the ones showing up at town halls and voting it. So that's the dysfunctionality of housing politics. I guess my, one question I have, and this is, this is uh, like a great many people in quarantine, uh, according to Twitter, I decided to finally read The Power Broker. Uh, you know, which is this famous book about New York City and this guy, Robert Moses, for those of you who haven't heard of it, who just kind of totally redeveloped New York City in ways that are, uh, you know, much maligned. And when you read this book, you kind of have two emotions. One is, uh, oh my God, I'm so disappointed that this person is just building freeways everywhere and no matter how much of a failure the freeways are. He won't invest in other things. He just won't listen to anyone about anything. But then there's another emotion you have when you read the book and you're like, wow, I can't believe they like totally rebuilt New York City in 30, you, you know? Um, and one of the observations the author makes, Robert Caro is, uh, I wish I had it in front of me, but he basically says doing large public works in a city, public works, you know, freeways and bridges in that time, but housing today, it's kind of a public work. Is, is something that democracy does not, is basically not good at. You know, that, that it's, a, it's a problem democracy hasn't solved yet. And there's a reason why many of the great roads, great uh, things that have happened uh, that we think of as monuments either happened because a dictator built it uh, or because uh, the city either didn't exist yet or had been destroyed by war. You know, there was a blank slate in, through some way. And I guess my, you know, it's, it's a tough question to uh, to be asking a senator, but you know, is democracy even up for this? You know, are we? It just feels at times like these collective action problems are too difficult for this process. I, I think democracy democracy can be up for it. I mean, remember, we were a democracy when we built BART. We were a democracy when we built the Golden Gate Bridge. We were a democracy when we. Uh, built the interstate highway system. We're a democracy when we built all sorts of major transformative, you know, infrastructure that helps define who we are as a region, as a country today. And those we're very, you know, we're a democracy. Um, and uh, the challenge is not whether a democracy can do it. A democracy can do it. Um, but we have adopted processes that make it almost impossible now compared to in the past. And some of that is good. Like I, I read The Power Broker a long time ago as well. And it was like uh, 10,000 pages, but it was, uh, it was definitely very, uh, you know, it was a great book. Um, you know, when you have, you know, this concentration of power where, uh, you know, this one person making these decisions effectively who 
you know, if he happens to make some really bad decisions, it can really have horrible consequences. And we saw that with some of the decisions that Robert Moses uh, uh, made. Um, but what we did was after this period in the 40s and 50s and, and 60s, where they also were planning to like, you know, build freeways all over San Francisco, including through like Golden Gate Park and through Glen Canyon, you know, where you grew up. Um, and, and, and so we, you know, people, I think, appropriately put a stop to that. And we also, we like demolished entire neighborhoods in the name of redevelopment and other name, the hate Ashbury was slated to be demolished. I mean, it's just outrageous. And so that was stopped appropriately. And the Robert Moses approach was stopped. But we then went to the other extreme where we said, let's make it really hard for anything to happen. Let's make it as easy as possible for even just a couple of people, whether or not they represent majority view, to slow down, stop, make more expensive, even projects that I think most people would say are a good thing. Uh, and so, we, yes, we built BART. I don't know that we could build another BART uh, today. Um, and, you know, even then, you know, how it was stopped in San Mateo County, BART was supposed to be much more expansive, and it was stopped through some very um, uh, uh, Bad, for some bad reasons going down south from San Francisco and then up north through Marin County. Um, uh, I just think it's gotten a lot harder. We, we need to find this balance of how do we, how do we uh, enable good, properly vetted projects to go through with good public process and public input uh, and so forth without letting it just be sabotaged and go on forever because of a fear of ever finishing a process. One of the best examples today is high-speed rail in California. Um, th this is, you know, a typical modern American political debate. But that, that train has been characterized as the train to nowhere, uh, at, you know, from LA to San Francisco and Fresno and San Jose. These are not nowhere. The train to nowhere. Um, you know, it, it, we need high-speed rail, but any objective criteria in terms of our airports running out of space for intrastate uh, flights to, you know, we can't just keep building and widening freeways. Uh, we, we need it for many, many reasons, but it's gotten so bogged down from, you know, Central Valley boards of supervisors sabotaging the land acquisition, to all of these, the sabotaging that's happened that yes, then has therefore made the project longer and more expensive. So the opponents can say, look, you're incompetent. Uh, and so we've, we've really designed a system that, or we've created a system that's designed to fail. And so I don't want to go back to the way Robert Moses did it. That was not good. But we have to find uh, something that is not the opposite extreme. Yeah. So we should probably get to some questions. Um, you'll like this one. Besides voting, what else can we do to advance housing efforts in our communities? Well, it's not enough to just vote. People need to um, organize locally and elect strong city council members that are pro-housing and state legislators uh, that are pro-housing and then make sure to hold them accountable and watch what they're doing when they're in office and go to city hall and planning commission hearings so they're not just hearing from the people who are mad that there's gonna be a 10 unit building on their street that they're hearing from the supporters as well. And that dynamic, the YIMBY movement, with that kind of consistent engagement has completely shifted the politics of housing. So beyond voting, it's about you know being involved more globally um, and also people getting involved in their neighborhood associations. Neighborhood associations have often been uh, much whiter, um, older, and more, and more homeowner than the community at large. We need more young people, uh, more uh, people of color, more renters to be involved in their neighborhood association so that when that neighborhood association goes to City Hall to say, you know, the, the Noe Valley, uh, you know, there's a um, something called the Noe Valley, um, what's it called, the Count, Noe Valley Council or something, a super uber NIMBY group in Noe Valley, but they go to City Hall and they say, you know, we speak for Noe Valley, we're the neighborhood group. Well, no, you don't represent the diversity of the community. And so we want more people to get involved in these neighborhood groups. Um, another question is, uh, I actually think this is a really good question. This is a question I get a lot these days. Um, this is, the person says, I am for rent control as well, but how do we allow for rent control to protect renters and while also protecting landlords? 
uh, who need to cover their mortgages expenses. Um, you know, I hear this a lot from people that um, they feel like, like they're basically being, the, 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 the California does not really want renters, landlords to exist. That its real master plan is for landlords not to exist. And, to, and anyway, my question is, how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, I mean, California, California until very recently um, had like horrible statewide uh, rents. I mean, the, almost none. I mean, ca what California would actually do, not California would as a state, the state government would not protect renters and then actually pass laws to prevent cities from adequately protecting renters. So we have cities like a Berkeley or San Francisco or Santa Monica um, that would pass local renter protection uh, measures, but for the large majority of the state, renters had very low level of uh, protection. And so last year we passed a rent cap where you can effectively um, raise rent by probably about 80% a year. And I'm sorry, like I, I, no landlord needs to raise the rent by more than 8% a year. 8% is really high. Uh, and so if you can't run your business with that kind of loose cap, um, I just don't, I don't buy it. Um, with in, in San Francisco, where you're allowed to raise rent at, at 0.6% of CPI of, of, of inflation, which in some years can easily be like half a percent or 1%. There are some, I think for larger land, or landlords that have, you know, a portfolio of buildings or have a 10, 12, 20 unit building, there's always going to be a mix of newer renters who are paying market rate and renters who are subsidized. And so I think that for, for landlords that have a, a you know, a non, a not small number of units, um, they can usually uh, often balance that out. The landlords that struggle are the ones that maybe have own a two or three unit building. And so if they happen to have, you know, stay a triplex and they have all three renters have been there for at least 15, 20 years, um, they, you know, they may struggle financially. Um, I do think we need to do more for, for the, and I don't think we should take away renter protections from people who happen to live in a small building. They need protection as much as anyone. But I think we need to do more for those sort of smaller micro landlords, as you might want to call them the mom, the true mom and pops who own just a few units, um, to try to support them because um, we're, uh, it, they're, they're, they do face some real challenges that the larger landlords do not face. And what we don't want is for them to go into foreclosure or just sell their build. What we've seen this, you know, they sell their buildings to a speculator who comes in and just tortures the tenants to try to get rid of them. Um, so we need to do more to try to support and stabilize these small landlords so that their rent control tenants can continue to have that housing. Somebody asks, is Senator Weiner concerned about the globalization of housing? Um, I assume this question uh, means uh, are you, you know, there are some condos that are bought, frequently condos that are bought as investment uh, investments, oftentimes aren't even rented, so sit there empty. Uh, I, I, I'm interpreting the question a little bit, but, uh, and yeah. there no, I, 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 I am. Like Vancouver, uh, yeah, that have passed yeah, vacancy. I, 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 so. I, I am. I'm concerned about, you know, when all of a sudden we have tens of thousands of single family homes that are being snapped up by international conglomerates to be used as rentals. Um, I'm, I'm concerned, uh, you know, and I think sometimes the issue can be overstated. We hear this in San Francisco a lot. All these new condos and apartments that are being built, they're just being held by foreign investors um, and not occupied. And we actually know that's not true when you look at the vacancy rate in San Francisco and the same is true in LA. It's actually quite low. Um, it, it's, in, it's in the healthy range. You don't want to have a vacancy rate of zero. That's very unhealthy. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but it was, you know, they made the same argument in LA too, and it was false. Um, the vacancy, it's all pre-COVID. I'm sure things have changed a little bit now. Um, so I, I think the problem exists. It is a concern for me if it grows. Um, I don't think it's at the epidemic um, levels that some of the people who are frankly use it as a tool to oppose new housing. NIMBYs have really latched on uh, to this. Uh, say, oh, everything you build is empty. That, that's not true. And sometimes what happens is you have a new building that comes online. There was a study that came out of LA that this huge percentage of all the new buildings are, are sitting empty. 
Well, they, can, they included all the buildings that didn't have their certificates of occupancy yet, or it's not legal to be occupied. And so they withdrew the study because it was just false. Um, and when you have new buildings that come online, they, they don't all get leased up or sold right away. It can, it can, it can take time. It might be that by the you, it might take you months to get your certificate of occupancy when the building is complete. And then it might be another, you know, three, four, five, six months before the place is leased up. So it could, but from the time that it looks like this building is done, to the time when it is fully sold or leased up, that could be a year. And so in the meantime, people see, oh, look, this building is built and look, there's no lights on. It's empty or only a few places are occupied and it creates a false impression uh, that everything is empty. But I am concerned with the trend towards um, the you know, corporate ownership and, and, and the global nature of, of housing ownership. Uh, I don't think that is healthy. I know Vancouver did their, um, uh, their vacancy tax. Again, I think the vacancy issue in California has been overstated. Um, and I don't know if we know effectively how to actually counter the globalization dynamic. Um, okay, so we have one minute left. Uh, so you're going to give me a 30 second answer. But I guess the question is, what do you, this is probably too big of a question for one minute, but that's okay. What do you foresee for housing next year? And how do you think COVID will change this conversation or not? Yeah, so I think next year, we're already talking and we have so, so many good bills that died this year. So I, I, I'm very lucky, lucky that my my own assembly member, representing half of my Senate district, David Chu, is the chair of the Assembly Housing Committee. So we'll be talking and engaging with the housing champions in the legislature from around the state, including in Southern California. Um, that my goal is for us to come up with a package of bills, including the ones that died this year, and perhaps some new ones, and to even introduce them all together um, and say we're going to all circle wagons. We have some work to do. We have to work things out with the building trades. It is not in anyone's interest to have some perma war between the housing community and, and the building trades. We need to be finding a resolution and locking arms. And that's work that we, I, I hope we will be able to do this fall so that we can move past uh, that fight. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we're gonna have to contend with, the NIMBYs have found each other. I'm partly responsible for that because SB50, you know, created the statewide network of NIMBYs um, and they have found each other and they've become more organized. <clears throat> and that just means we have to be more organized for a pro-housing agenda. Cool, so we are gonna send it back to Carla and thank you again, everybody for having us. Um, thank you. Carla is, uh, pop in when, okay, there you go. Welcome Hi. back. I am still here. We just have to wait for technology to kick in. Well, thank you both, um, Connor Doherty and Senator Scott Weiner. This has really been a fascinating conversation, and it's it's a complex and really important issue. And I have to say, I think you could both keep talking about it for uh, quite a while longer. Um, and I also know we had some questions that we didn't get to, so apologies that we didn't get to everybody's questions. But thank you both. Um, and I encourage everybody to read Connor's new book, Golden Gates, Fighting for Housing in America, since we clearly have a lot more to learn. Um, and now I also want to note what's the, coming up in our election series, and we're going to shift gears with World Affairs. And so next week we are actually fo focusing on shifting priorities, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East with David Rundell, who's the former Chief of Mission at the American Embassy in Riyadh. Uh, so please do check that out and join us next week. And in the meantime, um, everybody take good care and let's hope that the sun comes back out again some, sometime soon. It's getting darker and darker here. I really, it's, it, this is extraordinary. But um, yes, let's fight, let's fight climate change. Housing is a climate issue. <laughs> Indeed, and there were some questions around around housing and the environment that we also need to need to add to this equation. So thank you both so much, thank and you. thank you to thank everybody you. for spending a little time uh, with us today. And we thank will you. see you again soon. Thank you, bye, thank everyone. Thank you so much.